start. Okay. Hi. A very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us. People are still streaming in and we are live on Facebook. Now let's get started with today's webinar. My name is Wei Bin and I'm from TNB Ventures, the co-organizer of Smart Port Challenge 2020. And I am your moderator for today's um, panel discussion. Now the format for today is a pretty casual one. Uh, take it like a, like a casual chat. Now, do remember to type your questions in the Q&A function if you have any or comment on Facebook. Um, we will try to consolidate them and um, if it's not answered this time round, we'll reach out to you separately. Okay, now let's get started. The maritime industry, now previously it has been regarded as a laggard in adopting technologies. It is now starting to catch up with other industries. Now we are seeing more players with the likes of corporate VCs, aggregators like Pier 71, private accelerators like your tech stars, government agencies coming together to catalyze the growth. Now the session today will focus on investors' expectations and insights. Most importantly, I hope the biggest takeaway for you is to figure out how you could play a role in boosting maritime innovation. So today, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Elton Fong. Elton is the Vice President of PSA Unbox, the Corporate Innovation and Venture Capital Arm of Global Port Operator PSA International. Unbox helps PSA harness technology and innovation from startups in the areas of ports, maritime, logistics, and supply chain management. Before leading PSA Unbox, um, Elton had over 15 years of experience in infrastructure investments, growing PSA International's terminals portfolio globally. Next, we have Mr. Hyman Sinapu. Hyman is the InnoPort Investment Manager responsible for Asia. He started his career in the Shelter Group in 2007 and went on to build two more companies in East Africa. Uh, working in and with startups for close to a decade now enables him to identify great founding teams and understand their needs. Right. Lastly, we have uh, Mr. Charles Ludwig, a VC at Ecolabs Center of Innovation for Energy. Now, they are also the partner in SEED's Capital Co-Investment Program. Ecolabs was launched in April 2019. Uh, it is a collaboration among NTU, um, Enterprise Singapore, Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, SEAS. Now, it serves as a one-stop hub to help SMEs and startups to innovate, grow, and thrive in the energy sector. Prior to Ecolabs, um, Charles has made several notable investments in the maritime sector, uh, which we are going to talk on later. Okay, so welcome everyone. Okay, so uh, let me start with Elton. Right, so PSA Unbox is always exploring new spaces in port operations and supply chain. From Unbox perspective, what do you look for in startups and what is your investment approach? I think um, that's a bit of a technical glitch. I think I can't really hear from- Oh, I'm Elton. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just had to unmute my, myself. All right. Okay, no worries. Okay, I'll, I'll start again. All right, so <laughs> thanks, Wei Bin. Uh, as, as what Wei Bin mentioned earlier, we are the uh, corporate venture um, capital arm and external innovation arm of PSA International. And we do invest in startups that we find particularly interesting for us. And in terms of what would be those types of startups that we find interesting that we want to invest in. I would like to describe them in terms of a few questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, how are these startups uh, meaningful to the business that we are in as PSA? And as you know, we not only operate container terminal businesses, we are also uh, in the a business of uh, um, supply chain uh, solutions and services. All right, And we also ask ourselves, 
how do we want to have uh, whether we want to have a longer term relationship with those startups or is it just a startup that we're interested to talk to once and then maybe perhaps not have too much of a uh, 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 of a intention to to relate to for over the longer term and then we ask ourselves also how can we add value to the startup is it something that can help the startup grow and of course most uh, equally important we also ask ourselves if the investment is likely to be profitable so as you can imagine uh, through those sort of questions, it, it helps us understand why are we you know, investing in a startup. And if we find that we have the right reasons for doing so, we'll go ahead and make those investments. And in terms of the startups that we do invest in, I, I like to describe that as um, a late seed to a Series B. All right? These are startups that are relatively young. So what they have to offer is, is also likely to be uh, things that are relatively new and interesting to our business. And also at that stage, they... they oh, um, it's it's uh, it's probably going to be they are probably going to be at an interesting stage in their development where the the journey towards uh, success is going to be interesting for us to to, to join them on and, and certainly profitable also from an investment perspective. Uh, I like I'd like to also uh, emphasize the last point uh, in terms of um, seeking investment returns, and we like to do that. Um, just like any other VC would. And I think it's important that as a corporate VC, we, we um, approach our investments in that manner, all right, return seeking just like any other VC, because then it helps us uh, better align with our co-investment partners, which are likely return seeking VCs. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you, Elton. What about Heyman? Heyman. Last year, you know, Port has uh, invested in a uh, Singapore-based banker solution startup, Claritex, which is also a Pure 71 alumni. Um, so what do you look for in startups? And uh, what is InnoPort's investment approach? Well, we, we launched InnoPort last year um, as, a, as a dedicated early stage maritime VC. Um, so that we uh, actually get a better overview of the market and to also get access to technology. I mean, overall, we are, we are, in, 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 we are in an industry which is very conservative. Uh, hence, it is very difficult to innovate purely from within. So a corporate VC, I think, is a good idea. And I mean, we heard from Elton as well that this is an important uh, aspect of, uh, of the strategy. Uh, generally, we look for, for seed stage startups. So... Um, we, we like the startup to be able to show a product that is close to commercialization or that has, uh, has entered the market. Uh, we like to see the solution that we can validate, right? So, um, and we don't need to see huge revenues yet, but we definitely want to be able to validate, which we can since we are a large shipping group where we can validate most of the solutions that we look for. Because we look for solutions that ideally solve a pain point in our operations. So we definitely look from a strategic angle and uh, one where we, uh, we would uh, also certainly be able to, to add value to the startup. In the startups uh, themselves, then we look for enthusiastic and high profile teams. And the team is one of the main qualifiers for investing for us. We need to see uh, founders who can convince us that they can make something, something big out of their idea. Because as uh, also, I mean, uh, acting as, as a VC, the return but primary and secondary is uh, also on our agenda, of course. So the, then um, talking about teams, but the general idea and concept is, of course, also important. It needs to be addressing a burning issue in our industry and the one where we see market potential. Because ever so often we see ideas or startups coming, um, approaching us uh, where, where, where the market is, is, is too small or where the market is, is not in need actually of the developed solutions. So we obviously look for a, for a, for a complete package in, in, in the startups, uh, something that is strategically, uh, strategically valuable for us and uh, where we have the feeling that, uh, that, that the team can really pull it off. Great, thanks, Simon. Right, what about Charles? So understand that Ecolabs is also a partner in SIDS Capital Co-Investment Program. So what do you look for in startups? Well, that's a great question. I think um, Ecolabs, the animal of Ecolabs is that we, we are a translator first. And so we oftentimes are trying to find startup initiatives uh, that come out of a background of technology. 
I think a unique angle to Ecolabs and to our initiative to potentially the other colleagues is that we're also very focused on the clean tech angles and sustainability. The, can you hear me now? <laughs> Better, good. Um, we're focused on the clean tech angles and the sustainability angles of, of, the, of the business. And therefore, oftentimes these are initiatives that are um, enforced by regulators first. And so once the regulator enforces such um, uh, criteria or conditions, we look at how expensive that can be for the certain corporates. And those typically become the problem statements that we begin with. The second main point is the technology itself. You find when we work with entrepreneurs that oftentimes they will pluck a technology out of a university or from somewhere else, a research institute, or they built it on their own, but they often don't think about the entire value chain. And so there is a lot to do with that technology from a clean tech perspective, not only in generating that technology or using that technology for a solution, but also in the expiration of that technology or the disposal of that technology after its use. And so oftentimes these are the key points that we begin with first, the regulator and the technology. After that, I echo the same uh, opinions of my colleagues. Uh, we look at team, we look at unit economics, we look at all the traditional criteria that any venture capitalist would. Right, which leads me to my next question. Why are we looking at investing into maritime startups now? Is it the right time? Anyone? I can start if you want. Uh, sure, I mean, we, we believe that the timing to invest in maritime startups is good at the moment. But I mean, that is to say if, if there is actually a good timing in startup investments, I mean, that is uh, a, probably a question on its own. But uh, we, we see an increasing awareness in, in the market for the need of tech, uh, for technology. And uh, some solutions, especially platforms, require several industry players or stakeholders to work together and, and come on board. And we, we see this slowly picking up. Uh, we can see also in the market more and more shipping companies investing in startups, often off the balance sheet, but there are also dedicated vehicles like, like Innoport. Um, furthermore, we see an increasing number of accelerator programs such as uh, PS71, Port Excel, rainmaking activity in transport sector, ING's incubation and accelerator programs in Europe, the uh, likes of uh, plug and play, etc. Uh, the dock in, in Israel. So we, we obviously see quite a lot uh, there. So the whole ecosystem is starting, uh, starting to grow and uh, this is uh, I think a good good basis for uh, for, for, for the startups. Uh, hence, uh, investment at this stage um, find find uh, uh, find a good soil to grow in. Uh, also, from from then the regulatory side, from from government side, there is also a lot going on. I mean, in some countries more than others, Singapore is a very good example. Uh, they're especially active and helpful creating this this maritime startup ecosystem I mean, next to pier 71 uh, there is the the, the co-investment scheme uh, with seeds capital now where we are also an approved partner and uh, such initiatives of course attract startups and investors alike i'd like to echo a little bit about um what Eamon just said um if you look back um in the last three to four years that that was probably about when all these initiatives, Peer 71, Port Excel, the Dot Innovation, Rainmaking. This was it was probably around that time when they all started. I would say before that, the industry was probably not ready um, in, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, understanding the need to innovate and help, having um, um, an ecosystem of uh, startups up there responding to the needs of that ecosystem of that industry. I, I think yeah, prior to that, it was, that was probably the case. But uh, uh, thanks to these initiatives over the last three to four years, uh, the, the, the problem statements of the, uh, uh, or at least the pain points of the industry are not more widely known or, or now shared with, the, uh, with uh, more widely. And, uh, and there's been a lot more work that is being done uh, with corporates uh, to get corporates more ready to work with startups and to embrace new, uh, the new solutions that they have to offer. So I think now is a good time uh, corporates are now looking at startups, or at least um, are being more receptive to startups. Uh, uh, and, and there are startups that are beginning to notice that 
uh, the memory time stack that does have eight points to solve. Um, if I can put in my two cents, um, I believe that we are perhaps the, the best time for the pre seed and seed stage investor would have been perhaps somewhere between four years until today. Um, the, you know, these initiatives that I've noticed come out, the International Maritime Organization, the, the Pier 71s, the, now we are bringing in broad scope investors into the maritime industry as they're looking for new opportunities, new industries that are currently underserved. As a pre-seed or seed investor, we would have perhaps wanted to be in the industry perhaps two years before them. And I believe that a lot of that entrant into this market was in 2018. So the, to time it properly would have perhaps been four years from, from today. Um, right now, it's a fantastic opportunity for the maritime entrepreneur because there's a number of investors that are now crowding the space or entering that space. And so for an entrepreneur, there's ample opportunity to raise that money. But I recall when we invested in Ascends, which was a Singaporean company, maritime space back in 2014, 2013, it was perhaps a little bit too early at the time. That being said, it was successfully acquired back in 2018, which is right around the time when all these corporates, all these other investors started to enter the space. So 20, you know, if, if you wanted to time the market perfectly, it would have been a 2016, 2017 enter, entrance just before the rest of the crowd came in because then you would have the uh, best valuations in the monopoly on the deals. Um, but nowadays, it's, it's still a very uh, lucrative market in a place that's very interesting to us because all the regulations that are now coming forward that are enforcing a lot of the clean tech, sustainability, carbon neutrality initiatives that we are starting to see. Thanks, Charles. Um, in fact, earlier on you mentioned about Essence. It was way before when you invested it. Um, that was before IoT became popular, and especially That's in the right. maritime space. Seems That's like right. you actually have a good nose for trends. Right. <laughs> so among the technologies uh, with potential maritime applications, what are some of the trends that you're looking at now? Well, I mean, representing Ecolabs, the, the trends we're seeing are oftentimes the low-hanging fruit would be the Port electrification. It's the, um, what are some other low hanging fruits? Hang on, I got a list here for you. Um, port electrification. Oh, yeah, the uh, monitoring of emissions on board vessels. You know, one of the biggest issues that's plaguing um, the industry right now is um, ship owners and, and are adopting a lot of these clean energy initiatives, but they're unable to demonstrate how they're doing. So, and so oftentimes measuring the emissions of those vessels is a key part. Um, the orchestration of port activities is, uh, so a, a simple scheduling tool that's able to essentially organize the port activities would be a significant change. Um, and, and so more of these types of technologies, which are either basic data analytics or your advanced materials in the potentially the battery space alternative fuels, which is perhaps slightly harder to get hands on. So that's no longer low hanging fruit. These are some of the technologies that I think translate well into the shipping industry because they've been proven in other industries already. Um, and so that's where we're looking for those opportunities. Right. What about Elton? Let me guess. Um, are you guys looking for autonomous technologies? Right, right. So I, I, yeah, I think you guessed it right. Um, being a port operator, our interest in the maritime space uh, is uh, probably a little bit less on what's uh, on what's on the water, but but probably a little bit more on how vessels and uh, how cargo relates to uh, uh, to ports. Right. So that that's really what we are interested in as far as uh, in maritime industry is concerned. And then within that space, uh, there will be. Uh, a few segments that, that uh, a few themes there that I think will be quite interesting. I oh, yeah, you're right. Automation and autonomous uh, handling and vehicles would be interesting, and I think a lot of it can it, it's really technology that has been developed for uh, other more mainstream users that will eventually find its way to our industry segment. So it's a probably more an uh, uh, a situation of application rather than developing new deep technology. Uh, other themes that are also interesting uh, along the lines of automation is the use of video analytics. 
all right, that, that is part of the automation team. Um, but moving away from hard assets, um, um, I think the application of AI and data analytics in, in just so many transactions and processes that, that, that uh, make up our industry, uh, that, that still probably still has a lot more to run, although we're already beginning to see solu uh, startups trying to address that. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, this is whole theme around decarbonization and all the technologies that, is, that are associated with that. I think uh, uh, Charles had, uh, alluded to some of those earlier. Thanks, Elton. What about Hyman? Um, yeah, as, as, as the maritime industry is, is uh, decades behind other industries, uh, industries in terms of digitalization, I believe there's quite a, quite a wide array of technologies that we can be looking at here. Mm -hmm. And given the fairly immature uh, ecosystem um, and the limited number of, of maritime startups, I think we ha also have to be looking broadly as a, uh, as a, a corporate maritime VC. Uh, but some of the tech trends uh, we are seeing uh, and we are engaging is, for example, robotics, sensors, big data analytics, digital certification documentation. So, uh, for example, robotics is a very uh, interesting example for us uh, as, a, as a complementation for uh, our inspection business, or for our offshore operations, for our delivery services. Um, I think that uh, we will see Quite a bit of change in the in the in the market and the landscape there in the next couple of years. One of our investments is uh, performance rotors, uh, also part of the last year's Pier 71 uh, cohort, who have developed a smart inspection drone for confined spaces. And these are ra ra uh, yeah rather uh, examples of um, of robotics autonomous solutions that we uh, that, that that we engage in right now. For us, I mean, as a, as a ship owner, the, the sort of the autonomous space is, is not yet, uh, I think, well, is, 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 is in, a, in a fairly, di uh, well, in a very distant future, I would say that we actually see autonomous vessels, uh, I mean, maybe in, uh, in, in, in harbor craft operations a bit more than uh, in uh, transatlantic journeys. Um, others, uh, the sensor and analytics part is, uh, is, is an interesting one where we also see a lot of startups coming into the, into the space. IoT startups are popping up here and there, but uh, they are more difficult to deploy. I mean, when we're looking, uh, we, we, we should be looking more into predictive and condition-based maintenance in, uh, for, in, in the shipping space, especially on the vessels itself. However, ship managers traditionally go by planned maintenance schedules. And so it's not enough to invent a sensor that saves, for example, 20% maintenance costs. Uh, we require a mindset change in the industry yeah, from owners and ship managers as well before uh, such solutions will actually become a standard. Um, a third example, uh, yeah, I mean, we, blockchain is one of those buzzwords that we hear left, right, and center. And uh, it's, uh, of course, not the magic bullet, but it is a technology that uh, allows, for example, for secure digital documentation and certification. And looking at the amounts of papers we push around and that we handle, I mean, we have about 18,000 seafarers. Uh, all of them have uh, 20, uh, well, roughly 20 certificates each. So we are, of course, evaluating solutions in, in, in this space as well. So as you can see, it's, it's a fairly broad, broad, broad um, array of technologies that, we, that, that we're looking in, uh, that we're looking into. And, and uh, I think the, the ones that I mentioned, there will be uh, qu quite some development in the coming years. Right. On that note, um, Hyman, Bernard Schelte is a very impressive 135-year-old ship owning and ship management company. Right. So besides capital financing, um, earlier you mentioned, so what are some of the other strategic advantage can you offer to your portfolio companies? Well, we are, um, we are a, a, a quite a diverse shipping group, right? I mean, uh, apart from the two core businesses uh, of, of ship owning, we own about 100 vessels and manage about 600. So ship owning, ship management, other core yeah. businesses. Uh, we have diversified into into various uh, marine service verticals. Uh, I mean, it started uh, some a long time ago with uh, I mean a catering business for ships, a travel agency for seafarers, um, more uh, than uh, by now also a worldwide operating port agency business. Uh, we have a large development company called Mariaps, which has developed one of the most sophisticated uh, specialized ship management ERP systems. 
Uh, more recently, we've expanded into uh, ship channeling business in, in Singapore and, and China and Panama with warehousing. Uh, we have uh, then a launch board company in Singapore as well as uh, a diving and an inspection company. So you see, we cover a lot of verticals. And I think this is, this is uh, uh, very important when, when we look for startups and when we say we will go into the market and say, here, we can offer them something more than just funding. Yeah, we have um, a lot of experts in our companies who are willing to provide mentorship for startups or act as uh, a sparings partner when it comes to finding the right solution in, in the development and the route to market, etc. So this is something where we have a, a really good pool of, of industry experts which can actually validate and say, yes, you're on the right track or maybe take a, take a turn here and develop your solution in one way or the other. So they can, they can help and support there. Um, then we can act obviously as customer. I mean, with uh, with uh, if, if it's especially in the ship management business, uh, if uh, you get BSM as, as as your customer, you already have a huge uh, initial customer base. We can open doors uh, for startups looking for network, and uh, then of course, very important for startups, we have the opportunities for pilot projects. Uh, I mean, we we even do pilot projects with companies in uh, in, in Singapore that, that that we have not invested in. This is just to support the startup ecosystem because I think it'll it'll help us uh, to 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 really uh, nurture the ecosystem and 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 make it grow, and uh, for us, of course, internally to learn about the trends and developments in the market. Right. So as our yeah. So yeah. So experts and basically test bidding um, opportunities and pilots. Correct. Yeah. So I mean, we are we are diverse. So we encourage startups to approach uh, to approach us to gauge forms of collaboration. That for sure. Thank you. What about Charles? Well, Ecolabs is uh, uniquely positioned because we are a tech translation team um, that's tied very closely to university assets and resources. Uh, and so, for that reason, we have a list or a lineup of technologists uh, of of um, uh, professors and you know PhDs and man, the list goes on in terms of people who are expert in in, a, in very unique technology spaces. But when they apply that knowledge towards a startup, they can really take that startup uh, can create a step change within that startup from an R and D perspective. So in addition to that, typical resources that a university would normally give would, would be things such as, you know, we have eight really uh, high-end, high-tech lab, um, I guess labs. I mean, some of, some of my team members are telling me we have, we have equipment there. There's only one in Singapore and we have it. And it's for either the prototyping of a battery or it's for the, the manufacture of certain grids. Um, the other unique thing is because we're independent, um, we have a, a, a very unique uh, network of independent investors and VCs that partner with us, um, as well as other corporates in the maritime space that are also, I think, very similar to as, as Heyman has, has um, earlier referenced, looking for those types of pilot projects, et cetera. So um, see as more as that network, that opportunity that once you work with us, we can give you the talent and technology if you're looking for it. The, we can offer you the investment network or the corporate network if that's required as well. The list goes on, but I think those are the simplicity ones. The other thing I think is we're specialists in clean tech. Um, again, if you're clean tech, if you're sustainability, if there's a slant within that particular space, um, we, would be the, we would be a very good partner to, to align with because of our deep, deep, deep expertise in that area. Got it. So Ecolabs is the go-to guy for clean tech, basically. You, you bet. Yeah. Clean tech, decarbonization, carbon neutrality. That's, that's what we do. That's our bread and butter. Thank you. Now, um, then this question goes back to Elton. So PSA Unboxed investments include um, Clear Metal, the predictive cargo flow, Haulio, a crowdsource uh, container haulage, and also delivery, a crowdsource mid-mile B2B truck load delivery. Um, well, with all those investments that you have actually made, are there any still, still any gaps in the maritime space that you think has still been um, seriously underserved or overlooked? Um, well, there have been a lot of uh, startup activity 
um, some more successful than others. So I, I, instead of, of saying that there are gaps that are being underserved, I, I would probably want to talk of that, about that in terms of certain segments that still have not gained um, mass adoption. All right, and, uh, and some of these are actually pretty hard problems, which potentially could be uh, pretty good payoffs also associated with them. And I think some of them would, um, would relate to the use of blockchain, um, especially in, in, the, in, the, um, in the form of uh, electronic documentation or, or, or e-documentation type processes for shipping documents. All right, um, some, quite a bit of efforts down there, but, but there is still no standard solution that is being accepted everywhere around the world. Uh, by governments, by customs authorities, by by banks, and so on and so forth. But but that's not an easy problem to solve. All right. Uh, other um, that would be one autonomous technology, uh, especially around autonomous shipping. Um, some efforts have been have gone there, but but again, is as you can imagine, not an easy problem to solve. Uh, and potentially, and if potentially solved, would really uh, transform the way we we work. Right? As far as how. Uh, Port players would relate to the port. Um, so I wouldn't say I wouldn't say seriously underserved markets, but but some that that but there, there are certain very big uh, problems out there that still haven't been solved yet, but but not for lack of trying. Right. Thank you. So um, the next question, actually, um, there are questions from the Q&A side as well that's also been asking about what are the changes in the investment strategies in light of the uncertain times like this. Anyone wants to take this? Yeah, maybe I'll start with that one. Yeah. So during times like this, um, I guess investments in startups which are either um, COVID neutral, I mean, we are talking about the current uncertain times uh, around COVID, then startups that which businesses are either COVID neutral or which have benefited from uh, the, the current situation will obviously be quite interesting startups to, to look at. And uh, on that note, um, we've actually made a couple of investments in the last few months, actually since COVID started, um, and, and closed them, all right? So, so we've, we've made actually a couple of investments which are either COVID neutral or, or have benefited from COVID. And, and beyond such a, a type of uh, startups, uh, where each businesses have benefited from COVID. I guess in, in times of uncertainty, we, we, we want to, as an investor, um, seek more um, clarity around that the validation of the business and, and really does it really offer the value proposition that, that the claim it has, right? And, and, and of course, um, when it comes to cash flow projections, we, we probably have to create a, a scenario cases on, on what this current uncertainty would translate to uh, as far as uh, cash flow impact, or, or perhaps in the form of a delay of the next, of raising the next funding round, and so on and so forth. So we, we have to make such uh, um, uh, considerations also. Thanks, Elton. What about um, Inoport, Hyman? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, uh, I, I agree with uh, with Elton that uh, you have to have to look at uh, at the at the cash flow planning a bit more carefully in the uh, in uh, when you look at startups nowadays. But overall, I mean, we, we have not really changed our investment strategy in this time. I mean, we're we're still still looking for the same things, maybe slightly slightly more strategic. Um, because I mean, um, our, the, the focus of the group hasn't really changed in such times certainly also provide opportunities. Uh, for one, we can see new market developments, uh, but also which startups are capable of mastering these difficult times. I mean, yeah, we can, uh, I mean, already see uh, who, who actually plan ahead and plan ahead well. Um, as well, we see slightly adjusted valuations, which I believe is a good thing uh, for the market. I mean, as the sort of low interest environment easily uh, leads to inflated valuations, because obviously there's enough capital in the market. So this is also something, I mean, there are some, uh, because especially among, among sort of uh, smaller investors and VCs, uh, there is a very, very heterogeneous uh, landscape at the moment. Some are not doing anything and some are uh, taking the opportunity and, uh, and invest now uh, because of uh, the, the, the current situation. So yeah, I mean, we, we haven't really changed much, but we're, we're still looking for opportunities. 
and uh, are, are looking forward to to continue as uh, as we are to build the uh, build the uh, maritime startup ecosystem. Thanks, Hyman. All right. So my last question before I move on to Q and A. Um, there's been a buzz in Q and A right now, um, but as an investor looking into the future, what are some of the emerging tech that you would like to explore on? Anyone? Charles. Emerging, I guess. I guess on the when you're describing emerging tech, I like to explore. Are you? Are you? Do you mean in the next? three years or within this particular challenge in the next three years three to in the five next three years okay um yeah look i think i think for us you know one of the things we're starting to see right now is the adoption of of a lot of software um and mm -hmm. that's bringing a lot of change right now to the industry and if you look at traditional industries that are then disrupted by technology you find that software is normally the first to enter um, blockchain being a, a great example, right? Um, just uh, in my previous fund, we invested in a blockchain company that trades and buys and sells one of the large, world's most voluminous commodities in the world, which is empty space in those containers as they travel on ships. And the reason why that's been so widely adopted is because blockchain has a lot to do with cybersecurity. Um, and so I think that cybersecurity will be an important point an important part of the industry, regardless of the technology. Um, and I think that a lot of governments, a lot of ports, a lot of companies are going to monitor that, that uh, control. Um, from a clean tech space, th there's no change to that. Cybersecurity is gonna be very important to make sure that, um, that access to the ship's logs and access to um, the power systems within the vessel are protected in such a way that there's no harm uh, to them. So. I think that's one. Um, the other one that's a major for us is, you know, in in today, today there are about 120 ships being built in, in the likes of Europe that are currently being built today with um, uh, battery systems as their, as uh, for propulsion. Um, and most of those vessels are gonna be used in the waterways and in the coastal travel where we need to see more of a step change where we're going to be looking for some really compelling technology is stuff that addresses the ocean going vessels, something that I haven't seen yet in, in all the time I've been searching for maritime tech, um, something that really uh, improves the efficiency of an ocean going vessel. Because if you think about those engines, that hundred thousand dollar, I'm sorry, the hundred thousand horsepower engine, right? The size of, uh, what is it? Um, four story houses. Uh, four story tall and, and three buses wide, that's a really big problem. And uh, so from an ocean going perspective, you know, the batteries don't have the range, the, the, a lot of the solutions are not going to be able to um, create a real impact. So that, that for me would be very interesting to see over the next three years. We'll pay attention to startups like that. Thank you. So now let's move on to the Q&A session. Uh, like I said, it's buzzing in here. Um, we have one question from uh, an anonymous attendee, but he's the co-founder of uh, Navozyme. A, this question is to Hyman. What is the amount typically invested in the startups and at what, eval uh, what valuations? I think, uh, Hyman? Yeah, um, I think uh, I would prefer if uh, uh, whoever actually uh, is, is writing that. I know uh, Navo Zaim, and uh, I might have an idea who's actually writing now, uh, that uh, they can approach me afterwards uh, so that uh, we can discuss. I mean, we have, we, we look at, as I said, typically seed stage, but we also look at uh, a little bit later or earlier stage. So um, I don't, I'm, um, I'm not going to disclose any sort of standard okay. size. Now. Right. Okay. All right. Um, what about Elton? So are there any examples that you can share of the startups? Um, earlier I mentioned three um, that PSA Unbox has um, invested in um, that, uh, that actually have scaled up globally. Right. Actually, the three that you mentioned are, are pretty good examples of startups that we have, we have invested in and which, and which continue to grow. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Clear Metal um, is a startup that we invested in just before Series A. They've, uh, they've gone beyond that now. Um, delivery also similar, all right. 
now in Series B, they've continued to grow and to execute uh, their, their growth strategy. Uh, and, and similarly, Holio, Holio was a bit uh, um, a little bit different. Um, uh, we invested in them at, at really ground zero, all right, and uh, we, have, we have followed them all the way up to where they are right now, which is in a pre A round. Right. Thank you. So um, earlier you mentioned about electrification technologies in the ports. Um, someone by the name of Panda is asking, uh, why is it difficult to demonstrate electrification technologies? Man, um, I guess there's a number of reasons why it can be oftentimes difficult. First off, when we talk about electrification of ports from, you know, in, in the most basic way, we're talking about Replacing, you know, one of the simplest ways to prove or demonstrate electrification of ports would be replacing the energies of forklifts with the, or I'm sorry, replacing the gas tanks of forklifts with batteries. Um, I, electrification of ports goes a lot deeper than that as well. And perhaps this is where the, the questioner is referencing. Um, there is an entire infrastructure that it n normally has to go with the electrification of such a port in order to charge both vessels with whole rooms full of batteries or when it comes to um you know the cranes or or some of the heavier equipment and oftentimes that infrastructure is is frequently lacking um and so it becomes a larger um challenge and that's why we are very particular in terms of which uh ports we choose to work with so obviously in singapore this is one of the ports that we work with um, and, you know, through Pier 71 and through the efforts with MPA, that's because we believe that the ports within Singapore are better suited or more, um, more appropriately equipped today to electrify these ports. Um, it's not true for every port. And, it's, um, and that's oftentimes why these startups will stop when they have addressed the one or two ports that are prepared. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, Panda also asked about predictive and preventive maintenance, right? Um, and uh, using data analytics for electrical machines. So um, is, it, is it prevalent, the use, the, the, the use of um, such technologies in port areas? Yes, I would say so, yeah. Uh, electrification of, uh, of um, Port machinery. I, I think. I think it's an. It, it, there's an obvious, uh, obviously, uh, positive payback um, uh, in in terms of most uh, machine type applications in ports. All right. So port um, uh, operators would be naturally incentivized to explore um, um, electrification rather, rather than not. Uh, in the area of uh, predictive and preventive using data. I think I think that space is still rather nascent in terms of uh, of uh, real real uh, um, solutions that have very real um, um, success that they can demonstrate. Uh, in terms of uh, solutions being offered, there's no shortage of them. Some of them have been uh, deployed into the industry for for quite a while already. But I, I think generally the pre uh, and I don't think it's it's just an issue of uh, the maritime sector. But I think that that whole space of predictive uh, maintenance um, really could do a little bit more with some, um, more solid success stories. Right. Thanks, Elton. Now, um, someone from the Q&A, Grace Chia, uh, that's a very interesting question. We often, um, you know, think of um, the maritime innovation sector as pretty much like the laggard as compared to other industries. So Grace asks, are there any examples of Singapore maritime space leading an industry change instead of following a trend? And uh, yeah, and that is actually, that is actually usually more attractive from an investment perspective. Anyone to take that? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, maybe I can jump in on this one um, only because I'm, and I'm not trying to self-tout a horn or anything of the sort, but um, a, a very small example, and I don't necessarily, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say it's done everything so much as lead a trend per se, but, um, 
but when but ascends is is probably a good example it, it came through the regular channels it was a singapore startup um it was then invested by uh the private the private vc i was working with as well as nrf under the technology incubation scheme so it went through that channel it, i think it even went through spring seed as well i'm not sure um it was very early and and what it did was essentially monitor and help uh vessel owners curb the um some of the security issues they were experiencing and I don't necessarily think it's an industry trend. I don't think it's necessarily a problem everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but the adoption rate was actually quite high here in the region because that particular security issue that they were solving was something quite common in this region. And, um, and so I think it, it did its small part in helping the ship owners make sure and monitor that um, their vessels were, were being operated appropriately. So I wouldn't necessarily say it was a trend, but because of how early it was as a tech startup for the maritime industry back in 2013, 2014, I mean, for that reason, they were the only guy in town. So I don't know for so what it's, it's worth. The timing. Yeah, I think timing has a lot to do with it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one last question. So uh, Neeraj Bagi, uh, Bagi has a question that's related to um, general governmental regulations um, faced by startups and companies that have actually tried and developed autonomous vessels. And what are they? Anyone? It's a difficult, uh, difficult question. If we, <laughs> I mean, the, the 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 startups. I mean, I don't have any example really from the autonomous vessel space. But looking at uh, transportation within within port limits, uh, we've been uh, conducting several uh, trials with uh, with drones uh, in in Singapore anchorage areas uh, with uh, the Singapore startup F drones, and uh, yeah, they. There are obviously regulatory hurdles uh, of, of various sorts. Uh, there are insurance issues. There are various um, there are various authorities involved. Uh, it, uh, whether it's uh, MPA or CAS uh, or I mean customs, if you talk about delivery of uh, of certain goods for, to and from the vessel. So these are issues that that need to be uh, obviously need to be uh, looked at from uh, by by the startups and. Uh, I think it uh, can help to have also strong partners from the industry, uh, such as corporates, to uh, to actually help make those introductions and uh, and and support those startups if they have a good idea. Um, yeah, autonomous vessels is, is is something that is a, is a new uh, sort of a new topic that that, that we face, um, and uh, there will be a few I think changes and legislations to be part. Uh, to be passed before uh, something like that in, in port areas can happen. I mean, in Europe, we have seen some examples of, uh, of, uh, of ferry and harbor crafts being autonomous. Uh, so of course it is possible, but it's, uh, it's, it's still new and uh, the regulators have to, um, have to react accordingly. Maybe just, uh, just to add a little bit more to that, uh, if you think about ocean going vessels, uh, they need to call in probably different countries. And, and you're not just talking about government government regulations in one country. They they probably vary across countries. And and even if you get it uh, settled in one country, the ship needs to call somewhere else. Otherwise, it's not going to be a very useful ship. So that adds to the compli uh, the complication there. Yes, you raised. Uh, I, I would I would add the last piece there that there's a lot of opportunity as well. I mean, if we if we borrow a, a card from. Uh, the oil and gas industry and their usage of drones in the middle of the desert. We looked at a, I think there was even a startup that was at the switch event or um, last year um, that was delivering equipment using drones to an, a platform in the middle of the desert because of the vacancy of, of people around or buildings or cars or possible things the drone can, can collide with. It was easier for that type of technology to be adopted and it was outside of the range of what was government regulated that they cared so much about. 
Um, so obviously with ports as well, you can see the ocean very similar to the desert. There are some wide open spaces. Now, obviously there's autopilot, so maybe you don't need autonomous for that, but, um, but in the port side of things, yeah, it gets a lot more complex. Thanks, Charles. All right, um, so we are coming pretty much to the end. Um, before that, I would just want to have a uh, um, check out from the panelists if there's any advice um, for the startups who are going into the maritime space for the first time. Ayman? Um, yeah, the, it's, a, it's not an easy space to enter. First of all, <clears throat> I would say the, the, the most difficult uh, part here is not actually developing uh, the technology. The problem is the adoption within the industry. Right. And I mean, yeah, here I would like to rather encourage the industry players, not the startups of the industry, to be become more open-minded and more collaborative. I mean, we need we need joint forces to shift our industry into into the digital era. Uh, sh shipping companies do not really like working together, and this is what I would like to see change. Yeah? As I mean, this would really enable the maritime startup ecosystem to develop in a positive way. Um, so yeah having said that uh, advice to the startups yeah i mean they need to really i mean as in other industries they need to clearly define what problem they solve and uh, um that, that 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 the problem is really there uh that the market is is large enough for investors to actually come on board and uh, then to find uh, strong uh, strong partners to actually started off i mean usually with a large with a larger corporate so that you get some market penetration penetration early on to uh sort of get a more widespread um adoption in the mar in the market right i hear you there's a lot of mindset change going on as well right what about elton any advice for the startups advice that is uh, specific to the industry that we're in which is the maritime industry uh, I would say uh, take time to, to really understand what is the real problem, all right? Um, sometimes what you hear from the industry um, uh, could be just uh, symptoms of, of what, what is the real underlying problem that needs to be solved, all right? So take time to, to really understand what, what is there and, and, and the solution could be something and maybe perhaps a little bit more transformational rather than incremental. So going back to the root cause of the problem, yeah, take some time to understand it, right? It, it may not always be ex just what people say it is. Because a lot of the industry players, when they, when they artic articulate the problem, sometimes they are just, uh, they, they've been living through the problem for too long. And, and for them, yeah, it, it may just be uh, uh, um, something that perhaps they haven't studied a bit um, a more detail, um, taking into account all the possible new technology, application of technologies that are possible to these things. Great advice. Thank you. What about Charles? I think uh, my advice is the same as um, what I what I had earlier shared, which is for the startups. Uh, I, I encourage you to think about the entire value chain, not only from the generation of the idea, but also from the disposal of that of those technologies as well, if they have to be disposed or displaced or repurposed in some other way. Um, that's that's always a, a, a short-sightedness that we find. And, and if entrepreneurs think about the problem more deeply and demonstrate that by demonstrating the entire value chain, we, uh, that normally is, is a, a, nice, a nice thing to see. Great, thanks Charles. Thanks guys, so I hear you. Um, it's all about one mindset change within the industry, the sectors and as well as a deep diving into the problem and zooming out into the big picture, looking at the entire value chain. Thank you so much for your time and sharing by Elton, Charles, and Hyman. Right. Thanks to you guys for hosting. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. So to wrap up, um, I guess the maritime industry is in the midst of a digital transformation. Um, I, the ecosystem is thriving with uh, innovative minds and technologies. And you have seen it and heard it from the horse's mouth. Um, investors like them are on board to boost the maritime innovation. So I hope this has aspi uh, inspired you to find some exciting opportunities and potential partnerships. Thank you so much, everyone. And this is Wei Bin. I hope to see you around at um, 
Pier 71. In fact, tomorrow we have a road show coming up. Um, this is actually a road show uh, sharing on innovation challenge and uh, innovation opportunities by Jurong Port and uh, Houston Logistics. Right. So I hope to see you around tomorrow. And thanks, guys. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.